It's Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. So proud to be with you today. Let's take a look at the last book in the Old Testament called the book of Malachi. There was a burden. This man had a burden of the word of the Lord to Israel. And when he said that, that's to God's people. Now, <clears throat> over in the New Testament, the burden of the Lord was to God's people, and the Gentile was grafted in. But the Gentile and the Jew, when it comes down to the heart, are the same. God's people, I, God's people, whether they be Jew or Gentile, if they are grafted in through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, the Jew was grafted in uh, in the sense of having to uh, sacrifice the blood of bulls, goats, uh, small birds, many things that God was in charge of. The <clears throat> Believe it or not, this earth is God's farm. Everything on God's farm, he knows what he has. He knows every bird, they're his farm birds. He knows every <clears throat> fox, he knows every uh, everything on this earth. There is nothing on the earth, and God knows every ant. And by the way, when it comes to man, God knows the number of every hair on your head. He knows the going in and the coming out of your life. As you go into life, as you come into life out of your mother's womb, until the day you die, he knows every second of that life. God is an all-knowing God, all-seeing God, ever-present, uh, always uh, omniscient. He is here all the time. He Not only is He here, He hears and sees every thought and intent of man, whether it be good or evil. <coughs> God does not fellowship with evil, but He keeps a record of it. And it's kept over in another place to where when a man spends eternal death, life in eternal death, that is total separation from God forever. There will be a record of everything that man has ever done being evil or whatever. He said, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet you say, in what way have you loved us? He said, Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet Jacob I loved, and Esau I hated, and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Now, when he said, Esau I hated, he was not talking about the person of Esau. He was talking about the way of the person Esau. Esau <clears throat> gathered up things of the world and was a worldly gatherer of things. And God said he laid them waste. Even though Edom has said, we have seen impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I'll tear it down. Hey, they shall be called the territory of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Your eyes shall see and you shall say, The Lord is magnified in the border of Israel. Listen to what God is saying here. In Esau, he's saying that the wickedness of man is out there. And the wickedness of man is going to say, I'll get rich, I'll build houses, I'll build land, I'll buy all the land I can buy. I'll build all the houses I can build, I'll build the hotels, the motel, I will build the streets, the lights, I'll build everything. And God said, in one foul breath, one breath of mine, I can destroy everything you have. Uh, for instance, let's take a look. <coughs> People building mansions on mountainsides in California. Matter of fact, in places all over the world. It's not just California, it's everywhere in the world. The people will say, well, 
we are smart enough to have control over this mountain and we're going to put posts 300 feet deep and we're going to build this house out here and it will just stand forever and God comes along and soaks the ground a little bit soaks it a little bit more soaks it a little bit more and then one day it solidifies and gives way and there's a called a landslide and the houses and everything on it go with it all of those peoples in vain everything they did was in vain now in the last book of the Old Testament the people were living in vain they were doing in vain and God said I will come upon them. I will desolate their places. I will I will show some things. Let's see what about he says about their polluted offerings. This is in Malachi now, a little bitty book. He said, A son of honor honors is his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? He said, God said, if I'm your father, you children of Israel, if I am your father, and he says that today now, to the Christian church, if I am your father, where is my honor? And he says that. And if I am a master, where is my reverence? <clears throat> How many of you people don't reverence your mother and father, the master of the house? You need to reverence that. I mean, we've come to a day where there's no reverence, even in, the, even in the house of the father and mother. Children cursing their mothers, cursing their fathers, saying, I hate you. I wish you were dead. I, I would not. That my, there is a program. And my wife watches on TV. It's got Dr. Phil. And Dr. Phil is trying to reason out the problem of the world, leaving God out of the equation. I've got news for Dr. Phil. It won't work. It will not work. There may be a temporary coming. There may be a temporary change. But if there's no heart change, the problem still is there. The heart has to be changed. You cannot reason man out. You have to ask the Lord for forgiveness for that sin. Do away with it and start a new and fresh life in the Spirit of God. The, the Lord of Reason is a dead God. The dead God is one of the dead gods. It's in the, the list I saw the other day of over a hundred gods. The God of Reason was in there. The God of Reason is dead. Reason will not. Is a foul God. Is a not a good God. Now says the Lord of Hosts to the priest who despise my name. He's talking to the preachers of the Old Testament. And he said, you despise my name. And of course the priest is going to say, how do we despise your name? He said, yes, I say. And what we have, we despise your name. He said, because your offerings are defiled food on my altar. Listen, God told those priests to have the people bring the best. What was happening over here that the priest were taking the best of the offering for themselves personally and passing out among the laborers and those there that were there the bad part, the part that wasn't good, the good to eat or whatever. And God said that this is it. He said, if I am a master, where is my reverence? All right, let's get down. You offered the defiled food. In what way have we defiled you by saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible? And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and a sick, is it not evil? Offering it then to your governor, he said, you take that, <laughs> that little old blind goat, you take that over there and offer it to the governor. <laughs> the governor just might put you to death for being so facetious to him. 
if you were going to take something to God, you're going to have to take your best. That's just to an earthly man. So if you're going to take to God, you must take your best. Do you know that God knew every blind goat? He knew every lame goat. He knew every lame sheep. He knew every spotted sheep. He knew every pure sheep that was pure white. He knew every offering that was brought to him, whether it was pure or not. And he knew that. Offer it then to your governor, he said. Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? You can reason that one out for yourself. Of course he wouldn't accept it favorably. But now, entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us while this is being done by your hands. Will he accept your favorability, says the Lord of hosts? Let's stop right here for a second in verse 9 and say something here. It takes a body to bring the action of the spirit and soul. It takes a body to bring the action of the spirit and soul. Your body is left here for one reason, to worship God, to bring others to the realization they need to worship God. That is the only reason your body is left here on this earth. It's not for you to please yourself. It's not for you to be self-willed and think only of what can I do for me. It's what can I do in the Lord for the Lord and do it properly. Ten cents is a one-tenth of a dollar. And God requires that of every dollar a man has ever made. If you are a person that just got saved, <laughs> and you are a millionaire, you owe 10% of that million to the Lord Jesus Christ. If God puts you in a fellowship, in a church, in a place that you are in, you need to take 10% and catch up of your million dollars to that storehouse and put it in it. And if that church is God's church and it's worthy of it, they will do good with it. Our particular church I'm in right now, we need some millionaires that have not tithed, <laughs> that need to bring forth. We, we are in the uh, uh, annals of starting a school, a preschool, a regular school, all the way up to college. We have a college. We got a college before we got a kindergarten. And so we have a college. And we need a building. And the building takes money. And how does money come in? It comes in by the body of people. The bodies of people that come into the presence of the fellowship bring their tithes and their offerings. They catch up on their past. And they stay current on their present. So that their future will be good. <laughs> how about that? And, and let's look at verse 10. Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle a fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. Wow. These priests are like preachers today that are preaching in the pulpit who say, It is not right. To offend a person by saying to them they're sinners and they need Jesus that's a false preacher he's preaching a false doctrine because Jesus said I didn't come to save them that was righteous I came to save them that was lost and if you're lost you need Jesus in your life and if you haven't got him in your life that's what you need so a false preacher would say that you don't need him when you do need him but you are profane in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and its fruit, its food, it's acceptable. You also say, oh, what a weariness. And you, you sneer, and you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen and the lame and the sick, thus you bring an offering should I accept this from your hands, saith the Lord, verse 13? Wow. He said, you stole some of that stuff and brought it over here as an offering. You can't bring stolen goods to me. 
You've got to bring only the good. You've got to bring the best. Everything they were doing in Malachi was 100% opposite of what God said to do. They were keeping their best and offering their worst. It's like a person driving a Rolls Royce or a Mercedes Benz and doesn't put their 10% in the offering plate. They have stolen the offering to buy the Rolls or the Mercedes. But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifice to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among all the nations. In every word of every verse in this writing of Malachi, what I see here is 100% rebellion of the people against doing what God commanded them to do. We're living in a nation in the United States of America today where the people are in 100% rebellion against what God says. And now, O oh priest, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you do not take it to heart. My friend, if you've asked Jesus to save you and you're in a church, do not neglect to bring your 10% in. Do not neglect to bring a pair of shoes out of your closet to the, to the uh, closet where it's set up for poor folk. Do not neglect to bring a good shirt, a good jacket, a good suit, something good. Jesus would like your best too. God said he wanted the best of them to that day. And now he wants it now. Now he said, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuge on your faces. The refuge of your solemn feast. And one will take you away where then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. And that's verse 4 of chapter 2. I've got to stop right here for a second and tell you this. The same God that was requesting it there, he saw every movement of every person. Every priest, every Levite, every person on the earth. He saw what they brought, he saw what they did. He saw it all. And he sees it all still. There is nothing. Nothing. Not a thing. Hid from the eyes of God. Nothing. Verse 5. My covenant was with him. One of life and peace. Wow. God's got a covenant with every single solitary man that says, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin, come in my heart and save my soul. God has a covenant with you, my friend. And that covenant is to do as he says, to love him and his grace and his mercy, and he will show you favor throughout your life. And you will have what the peace of God in your heart. It said, and I gave them to him that he might fear me, so he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and turned away from iniquity. Now, Levi. Levi. He's talking about Levi. Who was Levi? Levi was a set-apart person. Set apart. 
And all the Levites were to be priests from then on. And Levi was set apart to God. And you and I are set apart. And God will do these things. And he said, from the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and the people should seek the law from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you had departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people, because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law. Teaching infidelity. Teaching opposite from God. Teaching infidelity. They were teaching that. I, I'm not going to get through here if I don't hurry. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another? By profane and covenant of the fathers of Judah has dealt treacherously. And the abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. I might stop right there for a minute and say there is a great abomination in the United States of America, in the United States of America, by the preachers in the pulpit who have defiled the word. Do you know there is nothing worse than a preacher that has nothing to do and doesn't study the Bible and from Sunday to Wednesday and from Wednesday to Sunday does nothing but the pleasures of this world on the golf course, in the restaurants, and in the places. His, his life will come to naught, and he'll be messing with some woman in the church without anybody knowing it. And when they find it out, they're all going to be shocked. But this man has nothing to do. And the devil's running wild in his heart and mind and in his life. And he's not in God's Word, and he's not doing what he should do. We have thousands of those today standing in the pulpits saying they are messengers of God when they are messengers of Satan. And so let's go on. And he said, uh, the profane, the covenant to Father. All right, verse 13. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob and the man who does thee being awake and aware of it. I have to talk to you in a couple minutes. I'm on in the middle. All right. Bye bye. Ah, uh, <clears throat> so here we are back in the book. Yet who bring an offering of the Lord of Hosts, and this is the second thing you do: you cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying, so he does not regard the offering any more, nor receive it with good will from your hands. <clears throat> Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. <clears throat> He's talking about divorce. He's talking about these people putting away their wives. He's talking about wholesale adultery <clears throat> taking place there. Wholesale adultery taking place then. But he did not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit. And why one? He seeks godly offering. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel saith that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. When a man and a woman become one, they become one in spirit. They become one in spirit. And God can divide that spirit. He sees the additional part of the spirit that's added to the spirit of man when he takes his woman. And he's saying, you, you deal treacherously. You have worried the Lord with your words. Yet you say, in what way have we worried him? And that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. 
Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And he dealt in he delights in them. Or oh, where is the God of justice? In other words, they say, Well, we don't believe God's a watching anymore. We don't believe he's looking anymore. We think we done got away with it and he's done turned his head, ain't bothering us anymore. Listen to the coming message right here. Chapter 3. I will send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord who you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, saith the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord the offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as the former years. And I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against your sorcerers, against your adulterers, against your, your uh, prejurers, against those who exploit wages from urn and widows and offerings, and against those who turn away and alien because they do not fear me. They say, the Lord of hosts. i got to stop right there a second. We have company after company after company after company in America who extort out of the wages of their people. <clears throat> they overwork them. They underpay them. We are as they were in that day, in the day before the New Testament, in the last day of the Old Testament. By the way, God is going to close the book and he's not going to open it again for 400 years. He is going to close the book for 400 years before Matthew. And he's not going to deal with the people. He's going to allow them to run their own wicked way and to run into their own mess. And they're going to be found that way when this refiner comes, Jesus. For I am the Lord. I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Why didn't he consume them? Just bring fire down and just consume them. Because he's a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. And he's a God that allowed them to get away with this, but they didn't get away with it. They will pay for it in the eternal future. Yet from the days of your father you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? My time is nearly come and gone. Will a man rob God? Yet have you robbed me? But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings? You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. If you have not tithed, if you are a person watching this and you are a Christian, you are one that believes in Jesus Christ, you better believe this. If you rob God in tithes and offerings, there will be no peace in your life. There will be no abundance in your life. There will be no eternal happiness in your physical life while you're on this earth. You will not have the good that you desire and that you want. And I've got to get a pair of glasses I can see this thing with. i got to go. Even the whole nation. Bring all the tithes and offerings in the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me. Now is the saying of the Lord of hosts, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out such blessing that you will not be in room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail in bring, bearing fruit for you in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, saith the Lord of hosts. He's saying you're going to be like Egypt was when the great famine and the great dearth came on the earth. Egypt had the food. Why did they have the food? Because Joseph was over there. Because Joseph was there. The reason Egypt had the food, because Joseph was there. <clears throat> there came a time 
when the people did not know Joseph. And when they forgot about Joseph, they forgot about God, and they forgot about the good things that God did for them <coughs> through Joseph. And today, America has forgot about Jesus Christ and has forgot about God, and therefore, they're going to have a drought and things brought on them that one day there's going to be a dearth in America that won't be understood except by those who are Christians who understand it came because of rebellion of those who rebelled against God, starting with the preacher in the pulpit to the man in the pew. My time's come and gone. See you next time. Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. Bye-bye.